Being a writer, you actually personified or personalised the, the cancer. You call it a, a blind, emotionless being. Um, you know, that is a pathetic fallacy. You've acknowledged that yeah. yourself. But um, does it feel like that, that you've been invaded by something? Well, obviously, it can't have emotions. Um, and as far as we know, it can't see. It is a being. The thing is, it, it can't have a life of its own. But it is an alien, and it is... Uh, it, it is alive as long as I am. Its only purpose is to kill me. It's a self-destructive alien. It's like the absolute negation, I suppose, of being pregnant. You know, having something living inside you that is entirely malevolent and that wishes for your... doesn't wish for, but want, is purposed to encompass your death. And keeping company with this is, is a great preoccupation. Once you think about it like that, it's hard to unthink it. How do you feel about the, uh, the people who are praying for you? Because the, there are some, there are some who are praying for you to go to hell. There are some, yes. many more in fact, who are praying for you to be cured and some who are praying for you to be converted. That's right, or converted and cured, um, to be fair to them. Um, well, it's the people who pray for me to not only have an agonizing death, but then be reborn to have an agonizing and horrible eternal life of torture, I say, well, good on you. Um, see you there, um, sort of thing. To the, I don't feel I'm very much obliged to engage with them. For the people who ostensibly wish me well or are worried about my immortal soul, I, I say I take it kindly. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a show of concern. It's a show of solidarity, which is a very important word to me. It, it's, um, it's a kindness. It, if it doesn't do any good, and I'm sure it doesn't, it doesn't really do any harm. The only objection I have is one I touched on a moment ago, which is it seems to me a bit crass to be trying to talk to people about conversion when you know they're ill. The whole idea of hovering over a sick person who's worried and perhaps in discomfort and saying now is the time to reconsider strikes me as opportunist at the very best and has a very bad history in the past. There have been false claims made by people who, you know, bothered Thomas Paine while he was dying or um, and published false reports later that he'd recanted on his deathbed. Even tried that on Charles Darwin. It was an attempt at a, a false story of that kind. This, I think, is shameful, and to the extent that it reminds me of that, I resent it. Bertrand Russell said, I believe that when I die, my body will rot, full stop. Well, who doesn't? I mean, it will. That's it. Yeah, well, that's... He, actually, he does go on to say a bit more than that, but, he, but that's uncontroversial. I mean, nobody expects to get their old body back. I certainly don't want the body back that I'll die with, and nobody would. <laughs> it would be no, doing no one any favours. So some reassembly of atoms would have to occur, but that would have to occur anyway, if only for us to be reunified with those who died uh, so that we could live and got, got blown to pieces for doing so. Do you think it's been a life well lived? Uh, I'd really have to leave that to others, Jeremy. I have to. I'm encouraged, I'll say this much, I've been encouraged in the last few months by some extraordinarily generous letters, including these are the ones I, I take most to heart from people I've never met or don't know. If they say that what I've written or done or said means anything to them, then I'm, I'm happy to take it at face value for once. I'll, I'll take that. Um, and yes, it cheers me up. And I hope it isn't written with the intention of doing so. Though I must allow for it possibly being for that reason. But in case you are <clears throat> watching this, um, anybody, and you ever wonder whether to write to anyone, uh, always do, because you'd be surprised by how much difference it can make. I regret, here's a regret, I regret not doing it more often myself. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And should it not be believed, or at least affirmed, or at any rate not repudiated, that you should expect to suffer for this? That you should expect to be reviled? That you, that you should be proud to be, to be abused? That you will be told that what you believe is absurd? That you should be glad to hear it for his sake? That those who despitefully use you are to be expected? And isn't that a rather dignified position? A rather honorable position for the church to take? Something that even a, an atheist and humanist and Marxist like myself can understand and respect. But instead, what do we get? An endless whine of self-pity, 
of why are they picking on us? They wouldn't say that about the Jews. An endless play on the ethnic politics and identity politics card. An endless appeal to self-pity, where you should be proud that you're in a fight for your politics and your, and your church. And you seem instead to be resentful about it. And perhaps, who knows, a little insecure. It's, it would indeed. This, these debates have been going on for centuries, though, and uh, yes, I, mean, you, you I think will persist. You quote Blaise Pascal, um, who talked about a wager that could be made, uh, we, we're with a, a god that would actually allow you, at the very last minute, to make a deal with him, to yes. believe for a brief period, um, and that wager would be that what have you got to lose? Well, it's rightly called a wager because there's something rather hucksterish about it. And I'm not a Christian, um, let alone a Roman Catholic Christian, as Pascal was. And I'm also not a theorist of probability, as he was. He was a great mathematician. But I say Huxtrich for this reason. His wager assumes two things. One, a very cynical um, and credulous God. In other words, a God who would say, well, I can see your mind working, and I know that you're wagering on me because what have you got to lose? So naturally I'll reward you if you say you believe in me. I mean, why does that follow? Why wouldn't you think that's not a very good reason? It's not very good reasoning. It's not a very good motive. You might just as well be a god. In fact, you should prefer to be a god who would say, actually, I have more respect for the person who couldn't bring himself to believe and certainly wouldn't claim to do so in the hope of getting a favour. Yes, uh, that, we're, we're talking now logic and, of course, a jealous well, not just God. logic. I think there's a moral change to this. Well, well, exactly, the, because there, there's an argument that the jealous God who, who would consign non-believers to hell is actually immoral, so why would you follow him anyway? There's actually a Sufi prayer from the Middle Ages that is addressed to the Creator and says, Master, or however these things are addressed in... Um, if I um, pray to you in the hope of uh, getting heaven for myself, you should deny it to me. And if I pray for you only in the fear of hell, you should send me there. Um, these would be bogus forms of belief. They'd be simply behaviorist, reward and punishment stuff, conditioned animal reflexes, um, coercive, and they'd require a slave mentality which is my second objection to the Pascal Wager. It, it demands of us that we think of this God as <clears throat> a cynical, rather credulous, rather capricious opportunist, easily flattered, and of ourselves as the raw material for a pretty cruel and meaningless experiment. Now, often we unbelievers are accused of being nihilistic and not seeing the lovely, deeper meanings of life. Well, what could, re what could really be more more negative, more, more pessimistic, more, more, more cynical than, than the, uh, the attitude I've just described. Do you fear death? No, I'm not afraid of being dead, that's to say. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. I won't know I'm dead. In my strong conviction, I won't. And if I find that I'm alive in any way at all, well, that'll be a pleasant surprise. I quite like surprises. But I strongly take leave to doubt it. Um, I'm, I can't be too insouciant. I mean, we, we, one can't live without fear. It's a question of what is your attitude towards fear. I'm afraid of a sordid death. I'm afraid that, that I would die in an ugly or squalid way. I mean, cancer can be very pitiless in that respect. That's a fear of dying. It's yes. not a fear of death, though. Quite. It was, so if you, I forget now which you asked. What do you It's think, a good distinction. What do you think... Of death, no. Of dying... Yes, I feel a sense of waste about it um, because I'm not ready. Um, um, I feel a sense of betrayal to my family and I like to think even to some of my friends who would miss me. Undone things, unattained objectives, but I, as I said before, I, I hope I'd always have that if I was 100 when I was checking out. But no, my, I think my main fear is of, is of being incapacitated or imbecilic at the end. That, that, of course, is not something to be afraid of, it's something to be terrified of. America is actually the country to which people came in the most of a hurry to try and find if that life could really be lived as a society. Some of them came to practice their religion freely, 
Um, many came to escape from persecution by other religions. Some came to be free from religion altogether. And that's why the Constitution is godless and doesn't mention the word, though it was not written by atheists. It was written by democratic theists and secularists. And that's why the meeting at Philadelphia, which decided these matters and decides them still for us, was a godless one, if not an atheist one. And that's why I think modern America uh, should be a lot more anti-religious than it is. It should pay less respect, make much less reverence to religion than its mass media, to which I'm coming, presently do. Read one page of Stephen Hawking about the event horizon, about the possibility that we will soon know, not where the universe originated, but where it has tended, and the event horizon to which we may all be headed. There is more to inspire awe in one page of Stephen Hawking than in any of the fantasies of Tertullian, imagining that he could go to the window of heaven when he was promoted there and look down for his consolation on the torments of the damned. There's much more to be awe-inspired by in a page of Hawking than any number of burning bushes or other such myths. There are those who say, and I believe they attack us in our very deepest integrity, in our very core, who say that we wouldn't know the difference, wouldn't be able to know the difference, wouldn't be equipped to understand the difference if you'd arrived at the wrong action, if there wasn't a supernatural warrant for this, if it hadn't been revealed to us in one or other set of books uh, that such is the case. Now, I believe this argument to be so evidently false. I don't have the time to demonstrate it in full. I'll take any challenge on it, but I do have a question that is my own challenge. You have to name for me an ethical action taken or a moral statement made by a person of faith that I could not make. I've now put this question to some senior rabbis, to a number of uh, Christian priests and Muslim imams and others. Um, and I've not so far been given an instance where that would be uh, defensible, where they could say, here's a moral thing we know about that you don't. Here's an ethical action we can perform, an unbeliever cannot. Um, I, I leave the question with you, and I'm always open to an answer to this challenge. It has a corollary question, which is a lot easier. Can any of you think of a wicked thing done by a person of faith because of their faith? You've already thought of one. You've already thought of another one. Um, in the course of the evening, you'll think of several more uh, actions of, uh, of wickedness, iniquity, uh, that are performed because people believe God wants them done, or because the person performing them believes he's doing God's work. This is a form of crime and, and evil unknown to the unbeliever. And I think if it doesn't make a case for the moral superiority of atheism, it certainly makes the case against the moral superiority of faith very well. Um, there's a second, and even more, I think, overpowering disadvantage imposed, self-imposed on the religious, because they can't very far depart. Rabbi Wolpe gets very daring with this. Uh, if you ask him what he really thinks about the texts that tell him what God wants, he'll, he will not say that they're to be taken strictly, literally. He will, for example, say that the Jewish prayer, I imagine he will say, I've actually never asked him correctly, but the prayer that, with which Jewish men are supposed to begin every day that thanks God, to, just to begin with, thanks them for not making them a woman and not making them a goy or Gentile. He says, well, you know, that's not really... No, it isn't. Of course it's not. It's not a moral thing to say. It's a stupid thing to say. It's also a nasty thing to say. So most Jews don't say it anymore. So if you follow me closely here, the less religious people become, the more moral they become. If the Quranic prescriptions on amputation and mutilation and stoning were all followed, if every thief in Egypt had their hand removed, no work could be done. So they don't do it. They should do it. They're ordered to do it, but they don't. They're ordered to kill the unbeliever in specific terms. In the Hadith, not the Quran, but in the sayings of the Prophet, which have the same theological and moral weight in the teaching, um, it is said that anyone who tries to change their religion from Islam to apostatize must be killed. They can't do it. They should. It's a divine mandate, but they don't. Because the innate morality that belongs to all of us, fortunately, comes to save us from the wickedness that comes from the texts. And what that means to me, and what I will continue arguing throughout the evening in different ways, is this, a very simple proposition. Man did not make God in his own image, as is said in the Bible. 
Uh, to the contrary, men and women made many gods in their own images, and it shows. After all, it's just as difficult for me to disprove that there are a thousand gods as that there is one. And every believer you know has gods he doesn't believe in. The rabbi doesn't believe in Allah. You don't believe in Zeus. Uh, Muslims don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was the Son of God. All of them think all that's absolute nonsense, but that their own belief is the valid one. Now again, I put it to you, either all these beliefs are equally true, which seems impossible, or only one of them is true, which admittedly is a possibility, or they are all false, and I am not the atheist you think I am. Everyone in the room is an atheist because they have a God in which they don't believe. <laughs> Rabbi Walker has a God in which he doesn't believe. I just say, I'll go you one better. I don't think there are any gods at all. Conflict is intrinsic to human history. Yes. Uh, and there will be some further conflict. Many people say it has already begun, and it's the conflict between the West and sort of Islamo-fascism. Do you think that is a conflict which can be lost by the West? Well, first on conflict, you're completely right. It's, it's unavoidable, and I'm glad of that, because I think it's desirable. Especially in the United States, there's a huge privilege given to the word unity or unification, partly because it's a very various and um, multifarious society. There's a big need for good manners. But if you say, I'm a unifier, not a divider, you expect and you usually get applause. I'm a divider. I think only, only division can cause progress. People say, the politics of division. Politics is division by definition. If there was no disagreement, if there was no fight, there'd be no politics. So the illusion of unity isn't worth having. And anyway, it's unattainable. The, what I do think of as the greatest crisis, greatest conflict at present is, it's a version of the old conflict, which is between totalitarianism and free thought, which is in other words, between theocracy and the Enlightenment, and the, the form in which this is currently being played out, you could define as the West versus Islam, but it's not quite so. Within many Islamic countries, there are people who have a greater respect for pluralism than there are people in Britain who would like to censor me for criticizing Islam, for example. But roughly, you describe the, the outlines correctly. Yes, I, I, I refuse to be told what to think or how, let alone what to say or right by anybody, but most certainly uh, not by people who claim the authority of fabricated works of primeval myth and fiction and want, want me to believe that these are divine. That I won't have. That's the original repudiation. The first rebellion against mental slavery comes from saying, this is man-made, it's not divine. And to be clear about what you're talking about here, you're talking about the Bible and the Quran. Yeah, well, and the, and the Torah, yes. Yeah. All of these are works of fiction. All of these are depraved works of man-made fiction, yeah. For me, anyway, um, to be able to say that I don't have to begin, as I would have if I was uh, speaking for the church, with uh, any apologies. Uh, we don't have a lot to apologize for. It wasn't we who framed Galileo. It wasn't we who said that God wanted the Crusades. It wasn't we who mounted the Inquisition. It wasn't we who sponsored Pavlich, Salazar, Mussolini, Dolphus, Hitler, Vichy, Franco, and the rest of it. And it wasn't we who preached the Easter sermon saying, saying who was responsible for the death of a mythical figure and creating ludicrous pain to real people in the real world. We don't have to begin by proving that our institutions and our beliefs are human, as all human institutions are. That we are only mammals, as His Holiness the Pope is only a mammal. We don't make a mystery where none exists. We say that we face the heavens and we find them empty and that some of us, at any rate, are not alarmed to find this emptiness and would be more alarmed to find the heavens full of permanent supervision and invigilation and that an ethical life may be led by someone with no supernatural means of support without the fear, if it is a fear, or the hope, if it is a hope, of celestial invigilation. Um. Uh, Chris, you fearlessly go where some won't. Uh, now, I know in the ch old church, literally, when somebody was up for sainthood and stuff like that, there was somebody who would play the official, it's where the phrase comes from, devil's advocate. Am I correct? You would have been correct until the last few years of this pope, who abolished the office of um, 
Advocatus Diaboli, devil's advocate. And, Advocatus And, and, and uh, fast-tracked uh, candidates of his own, including some very weird people mm -hmm. for beatification and for sainthood. So one of, the, one of the most famous institutions of the church, the one that tried to restrain mere superstition and cultism, was abolished by him to clear the road for cults of personality. Well, uh, shoot the pope through the prism of maybe... Uh, what did you think of this pope and well, now and his demise? Well, I could add to just what I would just said by saying... Look, he did ask me to testify against the uh, beatification of Mother Teresa, and I did go to do that. Um, and thus, I suppose, became the first person ever to represent the devil uh, pro bono, without an advocate, <laughs> which is a distinction of a kind. So I have to thank him. He was broad-minded enough for that. But he, he, he made more saints than all his ten predecessors, I think I'm right in saying, combined and doubled. And I think he did that for this reason. He had to apologize to the Jews for the Holocaust. He apologized to the Muslims for the Crusades. He had to apologize to Orthodox Catholic Christians, not Roman Catholic Christians, for butchering them in the Balkans and Byzantium and elsewhere. He had to do a lot of climbing down. But of course, he was infallible on everything else. All right. And one way of rallying the faithful in a time of doubt is to make lots of saints and, um, and stress the issue of martyrdom. It's a cheap trick, but it seems to have, um, it's a horrible thing to say, but it worked. Well, let me ask you this, Chris. What is it in your growing up, your back... Christopher, I'm sorry, I always do that, and I know you want to be called Christopher. Christopher, what is it in your growing up or background that would make you even care to act as little John at the bridge, keeping people from canonization or sainthood? Why, why would you go and testify? You just felt it was well, improper that you know, Mother Teresa was made a saint, right? Well, you know, she was a fraud and a fanatic and a fundamentalist, and therefore, I think, not, as we sometimes say, a good role model. Um, she took money from Charles Keating of the Lincoln Savings and Loan. She justified the Duvalier dictatorship. She said that contraception uh, was murder and um, that abortion was the greatest threat to world peace. She was, she was a fanatic. Don't you have to uh, give no, a pass, no, though, to uh, any... Mind, mind you, of course, you're quite right in asking me. I mean, it's none of my business who the Pope chooses to make a saint. I'm not a Catholic. But then, if I'm not a Catholic, why do I have to watch, with exceptions like you, uh, a mass media that has for a whole week acted as if this was a Catholic country, and we were all mourning our dear leader. I mean, if, if we're going to be treated like that, then someone has to push back and say this is not so. Well, listen, I'm enamored of the Pope in most of the symbolic ways. Everybody has. He seemed like a, a man of peace, and when a man of peace passes, I'm, I'm saddened like anybody else in this world gone mad. My feeling is, though, that at the end, I'm adamant about this fact. There's, if there's one reason for a church to exist, it's to protect the innocents. And we have priests going after kids in this culture, like, unbelievably. And the fact that I had an old guy in there who probably would have died if they had told him about much of this makes me long for a newer, more cranky pope who's going to walk the, the, walk the beat and swing the nightstick more. I, I mean... Well, well I, I, completely, I completely second those who were just applauding, but unfortunately it didn't break his heart when you found out. He knew that Cardinal Bernard Law was moving around sadistic predators, <clears throat> concealing their activities from the police, which it was his job to disclose, uh, inflicting them on parishes where he knew they would uh, attack again, and covering up for them. This is one of the gravest crimes in the calendar. This is the sort of crime that would make an atheist fear he was going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. It's the one thing no one can tolerate. Now, Cardinal Law, uh, who should be facing trial in Boston, is instead a fugitive from justice in Rome, given a special sinecure and a, a, a place of refuge by His Holiness the Pope. He can't get out of that. That's wickedness. Mm -hmm. It's also, in my view, wickedness to say that condoms are more nasty and more dangerous than the AIDS virus, which was the Pope's official position. It's lucky for him that he isn't going to face uh, judgment, because if he did, he'd have a lot of people's deaths on his conscience, as well as the rape and torture of a lot of children. These are things I wouldn't want to have to go to my grave with, even if I was sure there was no afterlife. And no one will say this this week. It's well, all piety. It's all pope all the time. And what about when you say man of peace? This is the guy who invited Saddam Hussein's chief henchman to the Vatican a couple of weeks before Saddam was removed and fawned on him and called him a man of peace. That's Tariq Aziz, another wanted torturer and mass murderer. This is a pretty grim record. Well, Chris, you better hope so or you're going to hell if not. <laughs> well... Uh, all, the most, all the most amusing people seem to be bound the same way. <laughs> and in what way does saying that you find the Quran laughable, laughable, laughable in places, in what way does that help the spread of reason? 
Oh, well, I think mockery of religion is uh, one of the uh, most essential things. Because to demystify a supposedly holy texts that are dictated uh, by God and show that they are man-made, what you have to show their in internal inconsistencies and absurdities. And one of, the, one of the beginnings of human emancipation is the ability to laugh at authority. It's, a, it's, it's an indispensable thing. People can call it blasphemy if they like, but they, if they call it that, they have to assume that there's something to be blasphemed, some divine word. Well, I don't accept the premise. Teaching of that kind, teaching about abstention, clearly cannot lead to death from sex. But to say that AIDS is death from sex is, I think, to commit an obscenity. I'm, I'm sorry to have to say uh, the, that the brothers and sisters of, um, of our society who have succumbed to that appalling disease did not die of sex or of their sexuality. And remember, homosexuality is not just a form of sex, it's a form of love. They died. Oh, that's interesting. I wondered, I wondered what kind of a growl I might get there. Well, I'll repeat it then. Homosexuals practice not just a form of sex, but a form of love. If you can't live with it, I think you're the poorer. However, what they died of was a filthy virus which can and will be cured. And the clear implication of what Dr. Donahue said was that it was some kind of judgment on their sexual preference. I'm sorry I can't sit here, rather stand here and take that. Religion is a, a combination of, of debasement and servility. I'm returning to a point I made earlier with the most extraordinary solipsism. I'll try and put that uh, better. Uh, in return for your being told that you sinned before you were born, we had a quick refresher on that just now. You sinned, you committed crimes that are original to your species, that we, for which you have no direct responsibility, but for which you cannot shake yourself. You're born guilty, created sick, commanded to be well, as Fulk Gravel puts it. And that in the Quran, you're told you're made out of a clot of blood <coughs> by your creator. In the Bible, it's from the dust. And then women uh, wrenched uh, even from that rather muddy, imperfect uh, creation as a lesser species. All this, um, and that you must go, as we all used to have to do, and confess your sins, say, mercy on me, a miserable sinner, wretched, guilty, unworthy. In return for that humiliation, in return for this total abolition of your of your self-respect, this conviction of having done wrong, you're told, but there's good news. The universe, the whole constellation, the whole, the whole celestial globe, the whole thing was designed with you in mind. So you can be from someone totally abject and totally shamed, a complete solipsist, a raging egomaniac, the center of the universe, someone for whom it's all been planned. And not only that, but God has a plan for you too. And not only that, he was prepared to subject one of his children to revolting torture uh, to prove his love. If you'd been present when that sacrifice, that human sacrifice was going on, you would have been in duty bound to try and stop it. But if you did, you wouldn't have been saved. If you'd done the moral thing and said, stop this now, I can't watch a human sacrifice, I can't watch someone being crucified, stop it. No, you do that, you've missed your chance for salvation. This is madness. This is madness. And how many generations of humans went by not even knowing of this fantastic idea, dying in misery and ignorance and shame before it was suddenly decided, maybe I'll, I'll torture a son to death today and rescue the rest of them. Who can believe this? It's, it's an insult, it seems to me, to, to self-respect in both ways. It hugely aggrandizes our importance in the scheme of things, and it greatly uh, diminishes us uh, as autonomous individuals. It belongs, as I say, to our, to our childhood. Now, as for the Amalekites, listen, the firstborn of Egypt, every firstborn male child in Egypt has already been killed on a whim, just so these people can make their escape under cover of night. Uh, I don't remember the, whether it's said of the firstborn of Egypt that they were members of the Al-Qaeda organization or whatever fantastic allegation you made against the Amalekites who are so thoroughly destroyed that we'll never know anything about them, like the Albigensians. We hardly know what the heresy was because of what a thorough job the Pope did. See how the Christians love each other, by the way, on these occasions. Um, what did the firstborn of Egypt ever do to this loving God that they should have their lives taken so his chosen people can run away? What's moral about believing this? What morally normal person will say they want the destruction of children for their redemption in Canaan? Professor Weinberg, Stephen Weinberg, puts it quite well, I think. He says, um, for, uh, 
in a more morally normal universe situation, people of good will will do the best they can, and people of ill will, psychopathic types, wicked types, evil types, will, will do the worst. They will do wicked things. If you want to get good people to do wicked things, you need religion. What do I mean by that? I mean to say that who, when they see a newborn baby arriving in their life, if anyone's ever thought, even myself, well, maybe there is something to this. Look at, the, look at the perfection of this little bundle. Look at the little indentations, all of that, and the finger, fingertips. Um, the, the most you know, leathery old cynic uh, like myself can have these feelings. <laughs> We're not total strangers to the transcendent and the numinous, you know. But, but they said, I tell you what, though, before we go any further, we need to get a sharp knife or a stone from somewhere and start hacking away at the genitalia of this little bundle. Because if we don't, we uh, won't be doing God's will. Now, where is, no moral person would do such a thing unless they thought it was divinely warranted. No moral person, I say, would uh, show contempt and disgust about the female birth canal, as all religions invariably do, and about activities related to it, I may say, in both directions. Uh, revol revulsion from it, disgust from it, scorn from it, um, and for all other forms of sexual uh, congress, there seems to be a dread underlying all of this, a dread about the genitalia, uh, a horror of women, a horror of their monthly effusions, uh, a disgust, as I say, for their, for their vaginas, that I don't find healthy. But it seems to me, in two senses, man-made. One, mammal-made, and two, made 